Good day, everybody. I'm Steve Levitsky. I'm director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard. I want to welcome you all to our weekly Dr. Class Tuesday webinar, formerly the Tuesday seminar. Uh, before I start, I want to thank our wonderful team of Fao Ibarra, Jillian Scales, and Gabrielle Patterson uh, for making this event possible as they always do. Also, thanks to our Dr. Class Mexico program run by the extraordinary Mauricio Benitez. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I want to introduce my co-host, Alicia Holland. Alicia, want to say hi? Hey, everyone. We got a really uh, great panel today. I've been looking forward to it for uh, a long time, which looks at uh, Mexico under AMLO. And we brought together four really outstanding panelists. Before I introduce them, just a couple of, of housekeeping points. First of all, we are offering uh, Spanish translation, English and Spanish language translation that you can access via the um, interpretation function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, secondly, we, we, we are recording today's webinar. It's gonna be available on the Dr. Class YouTube channel. I didn't know we had a YouTube channel before this year, but we do. Uh, also, if you register, we will email you a link uh, after today's session so you can get access to the, to the videotape. Um, Third, if you have questions for the panelists, we want, to, we want to encourage your participation, but of course we have muted you. Um, but if you have questions for the panelists, send questions via the Q&A function of, uh, of, of Zoom. Uh, we will have 30, 35 minutes at the end of the session today and, um, in which I will, Alicia and I will, uh, will take your questions and feed them on to the discussants. You don't need to wait to the end at any point during the talk, if you've got a question, just send it through the, the Q&A function. We will make every effort to get to it. Um, I've asked each of the panelists to speak for about 40 minutes. So that, again, that should leave us to about uh, 30 minutes of Q&A. And I'm going to try to close around 120 or 125. All right. It is a great uh, honor and pleasure to introduce four terrific specialists on Mexican politics. Uh, and they will speak in, uh, in the order that I'm giving you their their bios. Um, first of all, Kenneth Green is Associate Professor of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a member of the Berkeley Mafia. Uh, his research focuses on authoritarian regimes and political competition in new democracies with an emphasis on Mexico. He has published quite widely on um, political parties, voting, and political regimes. He's author of the outstanding and award-winning book, Why Dominant Parties Lose Mexico's Democratization in comparative perspective. He's also co-editor of the book, uh, Mexico's Evolving Democracy. Um, Viridiana Rios Contreras is our, will be our second speaker. She's a scholar and journalist who specializes in understanding Mexican inequality, political corruption, and especially criminal violence. She holds a PhD from the Harvard Government Department. So she has lots of friends back here um, where she wrote a really pioneering dissertation that uh, aim to explain the spike of violence in Mexico in the early part of the 21st century. Bidi is a columnist for the Spanish version of the New York Times and a writer for El País. Uh, and last year, I think it was, she was named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum due to her, and I quote, vision, courage, and influence to drive positive change in Mexico's political landscape. Third, uh, Mariano Sanchez Palanque. He's an academy scholar uh, this coming year at the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. He's also about to join the faculty at the Center for International Studies at El Colegio de Mexico. Um, Mariano, I had the great pleasure of meeting Mariano when he's still a PhD student at Cornell. Um, his research interests include state building, democracy, and historical institutional development. And despite uh, his very recent PhD, despite being very young, Mariano has already published widely in, uh, in US political science journals, including the American Political Science Review. He's also edited two books in Spanish on Mexico's political parties. Finally, uh, last but certainly not least, Andreas Schedler is Professor of Political Science at the Center for Economic Teaching and Research, CIDE, in Mexico City. His research interests include the subversion of democracy by illiberal governments, the dynamics of democratic trust, and authoritarianism and democratization in comparative perspective. Andreas has also published widely both on Mexico and broadly on comparative political regimes. Recent books include the outstanding book, uh, The Politics of Uncertainty, Sustaining and Subverting Electoral Authoritarianism. That's from Oxford University Press. And then more recently, In la Niebla de la Guerra, 
Los Ciudadanos Ante la Violencia Criminal Organizada, uh, which was published uh, a few years ago. So um, thanks to all of you. It's a great pleasure having all of you here. I'm going to step aside and hand the mic to, to Ken. Thanks very much. I'm going to uh, share my screen. So give me just a moment here. I hope this is coming through. Uh, yes, okay, excellent. Thank, thanks very much uh, to Steve, Alicia, and, and Fran for the invitation and to uh, Gabrielle, Jillian, and Paola for, the, for organizing the event. So I, I asked to speak first today because I thought I might be able to set the stage for my much better informed and more astute colleagues while taking a crack at uh, one of the questions that Steve sent uh, as a prep for the talk, he said, what explains AMLO's seeming Teflon, his popularity despite his administration's problematic performance? And uh, he, he's right on, of course, uh, about both of these things. AMLO's performance has been very uneven. He's been in denial about the pandemic while you hear these really atrocious stories, uh, especially from Mexico City, people scouring the streets for oxygen tanks and setting up makeshift clinics either to avoid the hospitals or because the hospitals are full. Uh, Mexico ranks 156th right now in the world on COVID tests, but 17th on deaths. Uh, the economy is sort of sputtering amidst the, the pandemic. Of course, unemployment is spiking and dependence on the US, uh, on US consumption is really increasing at a time when we have weak demand in our economy. But the economy wasn't doing so great even before the pandemic. Uh, investment and in capital formation, uh, as well as uh, overall GDP had been shrinking since mid 2019. The security situation is really bad. The murder rate reached an all time high in 2019 and has remained about the same in 2020. And this caps about 14 years of tremendously expanding uh, violence since the recent incarnation of the war on drugs started in 2006. Yet, AMLO's approval rating is at 65%. So why is there such a large gap between performance and approval? And will AMLO and his Morena party be able to close this gap? Have they created um, uh, sorry, will they be able to keep this gap open is what I mean to say. Have they created essentially a bulletproof political movement, one that, uh, that has fundamentally realigned Mexico's politics? Well, the first thing to note is that uh, the approval rating isn't entirely divorced from performance. Uh, it turns out that over the first two years, as you see down here, AMLO has lost 11 percentage points in his rating, it's just that uh, he, um, he started out so high. Uh, his approval rating when he started office was at 76%, uh, higher than others, although close to Fox. And, and so he's got a cushion. So part of the answer to this question is, you know, sort of another question about why did AMLO start with such an incredibly high approval rating? And as I'm sure most of you know, he won the presidency with this incredible margin. He won 53% of the vote, which is just really outstanding in a four-way race. And, um, and he managed to get working super majorities in the lower house and close in the Senate with, uh, with the uh, defections from other parties and additions to, um, to Morena. So why is it that he won so big? Why did he start out with such an incredibly high approval rating? And, and I just wanna quickly go through a few reasons. Most of these I developed together with uh, Mariano Sanchez Dalenquer, one of our other speakers in a journal of democracy piece. So the, the first thing is that the other options had really been tried and, and found wanting. The, the PRI had been in power, the PAN had been in power for, for two terms. And, and so voters were willing to try the other major political force in the country, which at this time uh, in 2018 was, was Morena and AMLO. Um, the second reason is that these others, uh, these other political forces had failed to resolve some of, or even make progress on some of Mexico's most chronic problems. I mean, here's a, a brief representation of poverty 
uh, that really hadn't changed uh, much since the series starts here in 1992. There's about a one percentage point drop in housing and food poverty. So free market economics really hadn't been able to address uh, significant poverty. As I mentioned previously, the murder rate absolutely skyrockets starting in 2006. You can see there's a long period of decline in, in homicides and then just a huge spike with the onset of, uh, of Calderon's uh, approach to the war on drugs in 2006. And corruption seemed endemic. I mean, here's this famous picture of the prior president, Peña Nieto, sat, surrounded by governors from the PRI. All the named ones, these, these 10, have either been accused or convicted of, of corruption. Um, and so, you know, two reasons now. We've got the sort of this new third way and that the, the prior approach really hadn't resolved Mexico's chronic problems. But uh, a final one is surprisingly weak partisanship. Uh, at the onset of the, uh, or at the start of the 2018 contest, some estimates put nonpartisanship, independence, at about 70% of the entire population. Others had it as low as 50%, but, but really, quite high. And even those who count themselves as partisans often act as if they are not partisans. So AMLO rides this wave of intense dissatisfaction with the performance of, of prior presidents. He wins a near supermajority uh, in both houses of Congress in a system that already clarifies responsibility for performance failures. And he wins with uh, an electorate that's surprisingly unmoored by partisan attachments. So it seems to me that these same characteristics that brought him to power uh, militate against the creation of a stable political movement as we move forward. The chronic problems aren't abating. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has really stalled progress across the board. The projections for the midterm elections that are coming up in June indicate that Morena might lose a few seats, but it's going to retain its functional majority in Congress. And, uh, and so we have a very vulnerable political movement here. Um, AMLO can probably deflect some responsibility for performance failures by continuing to attack his domestic foes, but he's also lost uh, an incredible nemesis in Trump, right? He can't blame Trump, Trump any longer for deploying the National Guard to the southern border or for forcing him to accept the tenets of USMCA, the crowning achievement of free market economics in, in North America. And, and Morena really hasn't durably realigned the electorate. If we look at uh, partisan identification here, independents still count for almost half of the electorate. And Morena itself has started to slip some, maybe lost about 10 percentage points uh, of partisan identification. It's really unlikely that Morena is very quickly going to become imbued with this kind of deep well of cultural attachment like Argentine Peronism, especially once AMLO is out of the picture, he can't run again. There's no reelection for executive offices in Mexico. And, uh, and so identification with Morena without AMLO, I bet is going to be very weak. And I just wanna to point to two elements of really significant vulnerability. One is that when you look at the data on identification with Morena, it's very strongly associated with uh, concern over corruption. So Morena could be one significant corruption scandal away from absolute disaster. I mean, we could be looking at a situation that's like Lula uh, and Dilma in, in Brazil, where the PT just plummets uh, with, with a corruption scandal. It wouldn't take something quite that big. And, um, uh, and Morena also has an increasing problem with, uh, with female voters that I hope we're going to hear more about today. Uh, they have much more support among men, and there are a series of reasons why. So the system isn't nearly as unstructured as some other Latin American party systems. It's not Peru, but it looked like Mexico was on the road to being Uruguay, a very highly structured party system, and it's really not that. 
I suspect that AMLO is not Teflon, Morena certainly isn't Teflon, and that uh, we could be looking at significant change in the future. So with that, let me just turn it over to people who know a whole lot more than I do. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Vidi, you're up next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Steve, Alicia. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So let me talk. Um, let me be very brief. So I want to talk about three things today. The first one is uh, why there is a demand for populism in Mexico. The second is about the supply for populism in Mexico and its main supplier, in this case, uh, Lopez Obrador. And then finally, whether Lopez Obrador is or not a threat to democracy. So first, uh, demand for populism in Mexico. Demand for populism in Mexico is, is, is quite high. So um, anti-establishment sentiments uh, are actually quite common and are much more common in Mexico than in other countries. 70% of Mexicans believe that there is a mafia del poder. Mafia del poder is the term created by AMLO to refer to a predatory political and economic elite that has enriched itself basically at the expense of the rest of, of Mexicans. 88% of Mexicans, according to Latino Barometro, believe that politicians only defend the interests of the rich and the powerful. So overall, two thirds of Mexicans have populist tendencies, a figure much higher than other countries, uh, let's say uh, the US, Great Britain, France, uh, in those countries you get 38% uh, or less of these uh, preferences. So am I surprised? Well, uh, no, not really. Um, it's actually not normal that a country like Mexico, that is the 15th largest economy of the world, a member of the, the OCDE, and a top trade partner of the most powerful economy in the world, meaning uh, the US. Uh, it's not normal that, uh, for example, life expectancy in Mexico has diminished since 2000. Four. Actually, the only country that saw uh, life expectancy uh, diminishing in the in the same period is uh, is Venezuela. But but well, we all know Venezuela is a humanitarian crisis. Uh, taxation in Mexico is lower than in the Bahamas. So Mexico collects the equivalent of 16 points of GDP uh, in taxes every year while the Bahamas collect 18 points. This is uh, round numbers. And of course, uh, Mexico is brutally poor, right? Like 42% of the population lives in poverty and 38% of workers do not make enough money uh, to feed their families. So yes, yes, there are some seriously uh, serious, serious problems in Mexico and, and, and predatory and privileged elites in the Mexican economy that have definitely uh, benefit from what's going on. Now, uh, what about the supply? Well, um, AMLO was elected with the mandate to crush that elite, right? And, and he represents this uh, anti-establishment sentiment and claims to also represent the will of the people. So as we know uh, from Latin America, when you are elected with such a mandate, there are only basically only two things that, that can happen. Either you succeed in changing the balance of power or uh, typically, uh, as we have seen in, in Latin America, you destroy democratic institutions while trying, right? So how is AMLO doing on these two uh, possibilities? Is AMLO succeeding? Well, uh, yes, in some, in some instances, he is succeeding. I, I would say he's not succeeding enough, but he's definitely succeeding on some, on some areas. And let me, let me give you some examples. Labor rights, right? AMLO approved a historical labor law reform that allowed uh, for the first time since the revolution to have democratically elected unions in Mexico. However, uh, he's not spending enough money on implementing this law, so it's unclear whether it will eventually succeed, but it's, it's, a, it's a historical, his, uh, historical, completely historical labor law reform. Second, in terms of corruption, well, uh, according to Transparency International, uh, during, the, during 2017, 44% of Mexicans paid a bribe. 
Um, and now, uh, the, the last figure that we have for 2019 shows that uh, that number has plumped to only 34%. So we are seeing uh, significant reductions in corruption. This is not perception. This is actual uh, measures of, of corruption. Now, um, we have seen some recent corruption scandals that have uh, hit uh, AMLO quite closely, including one of his closer aides, including his own brother. So that's why I, I'm not sure if I'm with Ken on, on thinking that um, he's going to be hit eventually by a large corruption scandal because he has, right? Like, and, and he does seem to be kind of like vaccinated against it, right? Um, then third, in terms of violence, right? Um, I, I think he has made also quite significant advan uh, uh, advances. Calderon, for example. During Calderon, the total number of homicides increased in 82%. During Peña Nieto, it increased on 40% for zero. During AMLO, we basically see a flat tendency. This is pre-pandemic, obviously, uh, with the pandemic, uh, things have shifted, but, but this is what we were seeing before the pandemic. However, um, the assassination of females is still unacceptably high, right? And that is causing uh, some protests around the country. I'm sure we will talk more about that. And then finally, uh, fourth important success, I would say, is tax collection. AMLO has increased tax collection during the pandemic, during a recession, which is not normal, basically by, by charging large companies uh, the taxes that they own by, by collecting them. Uh, however, uh, even with those, those taxes, um, of course, Mexico, Mexican go the Mexican government just does not have enough money. Uh, and AMLO, actually, when you look at the numbers, which is really interesting, AMLO spends less in social programs than Peña Nieto used to spend in 2014. And the reason is basically oil, right? Like AMLO just had more money in 2014. Uh, sorry, Peña Nieto had more money in 2014 than AMLO has today, even after uh, increasing tax collection. And then there are some things that AMLO is doing just really, really bad, right? So AMLO refuses to wear a mask. Uh, he conducts insufficient testing to trace the pandemic. And most importantly, something that Alicia has mentioned, um, he rejects basically any meaningful increase in public expenditure to help the unemployed and the small businesses during the pandemic. Um, personally, I also think that AMLO is not doing quite enough to tax the rich, to endorse the feminist movement, and to spend on the poor. Uh, but, but well, that's my point of view, because when we look at the actual statistics of approval, what we see is that AMLO has a 63% approval approval rate. So what, why is this happening? Briefly, I think a couple things are, are, are important to mention. One is um, he has a very large approval rate because Mexicans see the pandemic as an external shock. Uh, basically, they don't think that AMLO is responsible for what is happening. Actually, most Mexicans agree that the economy should open meaning that there shouldn't be quarantines um, because people have to work, right? So it's a, it's a society that kind of like, uh, it's accepting the pandemic as just something that happens. Uh, and then the second important thing is uh, Morena, right, uh, is perceived to be less corrupt. Uh, besides, you know, even if we they have seen corruption scandals, right? So 45% of uh, corruption, um, Sorry, sorry, 45% of Mexicans think that corruption is more common in the opposition parties uh, than, in, than in Morena, right? So um, we just talk about how AMLO is, in my opinion, not succeeding enough on changing the balance of power in Mexico. So now let me move to my, my last point, which is um, whether AMLO is a threat to democracy or, or not, right? And um, my assessment here is that there are definitely some red flags, uh, but, I, but I think that Mexico's democracy at the end is going to triumph. And, and let me explain you why. So first, um, OK, among pundits, uh, it, it's becoming increasingly common to argue that AMLO is a threat to democracy, that uh, he has been accused for, of being a threat uh, just by doing uh, 
what are normal things that majoritarian governments do, uh, proposing a change to the constitution, uh, approving laws to prevent tax evasion, changing budget priorities, appointing judges, approving new laws uh, without consulting business elites, uh, just, just doing regular things that you would expect with a majoritarian government. So, so what's my take? Why, why is this happening? Well, I think Mexico is not used to have a majoritarian government. Actually, Mexicans associate uh, majorities uh, with the ghost of the pre, uh, the ghost of the hegemonic party of last century. And AMLO causes so much fear because his majority is in many ways, as Ken was saying, unprecedented, right? AMLO is the first president elected with a majority of votes, 53% since 1988. AMLO is also uh, a president that got a majority in Congress, and that's something that Mexico hadn't seen since 1994. Uh, so uh, AMLO can legally perform changes that have been impossible in Mexico for a quarter of a century, and that's something that creates a lot of shock. However, when we look at the actions of AMLO, AMLO really doesn't check many of the boxes of an authoritarian government, right? He hasn't proposed to cancel elections. He hasn't conducted mass protests to force uh, changes in the government. He could, right? He has a lot of uh, people that follows him. He has accepted the results of recent elections, like in Coahuila, where Morena last year lost. Uh, he has never refused to uh, tacitly uh, endorse he, sorry, see, he has refused to tacitly endorse uh, violence by, by his, supported, his supporters, and he has not approved laws to restrain the freedom of the press. So just to, just to finish, let me say a couple of things that are problematic and why I think that uh, Mexico is going to be successful or not devolving into a completely authoritarian regime. So first, um, yeah, the first thing that sets of the alarms. He does deny the legitimacy of his opponents. His morning press conference uh, describes, uh, in his morning press conference, he describes his enemies as criminals and he constantly disqualifies them, particularly business elites and think tanks. Second, he's quite intolerant to criticism. Uh, he has threatened to take legal actions against his critics and civil society and constantly criticizes the media when it does not favor him. And then finally, and most concerning, I think that AMLO is not institutional. He dislikes the rules of the game. He, he constantly talks about the government as a sick and old elephant, el elefante reumatico, uh, because it takes too long to take action because, you know, the state is, the, has so many procedures. So contrary to what you would expect from a president with a majority, he has decided to govern primarily not through substantive reform and legislation, but rather through approving procedural changes, secondary laws, executive orders. And of course, because these actions are regularly not well designed, because he doesn't take his, he and his team doesn't take the effort to do it well, uh, they regularly conflict with previous laws. So they end up being challenged in courts. As a result, uh, there has been uh, three times more legal challenges in AMLO's agenda than in Peña Nieto's. Uh, so AMLO basically doesn't know how to govern, doesn't like it, uh, he refuses to be technical. Now, finally. I'm hopeful for Mexico because I think that institutions have proved to be solid and there are plenty of examples. Uh, so when he threatened, for example, to take legal actions against Nexus, a magazine that was very critic uh, of him, the tribunal stopped that from happening. Recently, he criticized a judge for ruling against one of his laws and the Supreme Court basically answered that they will just follow the regular procedure uh, to deal with this type of complaints. And in it, the Instituto Nacional electoral keeps being quite solid like uh, just a few days ago they they approved a reform that reduced uh, Morena over representation in Congress and that it's going to be very helpful for the opposition in 2021. So I'm hopeful that Mexico, you know, the process of democratization in Mexico in many ways has been a process of constructing institutions, not, not necessarily uh, constructing like, uh, you know, a, a really uh, like social development, but constructing institutions. Uh, and I think that Mexico is quite solid on that. And I, and I think that I may be wrong, but I, I think that so far institutions in Mexico will remain strong. Thank you.
Thank you, Vidi. Um, next up, Mariano. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Class, um, Steve, Alusha, Fran, everyone for the invitation. It's a real honor to be part of this panel in, in such good company. Um, I would like to begin by taking a step back and looking at Mexico's trajectory of political development in the past few decades to sort of situate the AMLO presidency in its context. And I believe we need to think about political development in, in at least two dimensions. First is the construction and strengthening of democratic institutions. And the second is state building, the, the strengthening of the capacity of the state of governing institutions to deliver basic public goods, improve living standards, in short, to, to govern effectively. Without um, effective democratic institutions, including clean elections and constitutional checks and balances, citizens do not have the ability to produce peaceful transfers of power through the ballot box and basic civil and political rights and liberties go unprotected. Without a strong functioning state, however, democratic regimes are on a weak institutional foundation, even when they can provide for free and fair elections. Um, with a weak state, governments cannot deliver results, chronic governance problems erode citizen satisfaction with public institutions. They perceive that democracy is not working, that all parties are the same. And let me go ahead and share my screen um, very quickly, because I would like to use this graph um, I'd like to use this graph to make a point that I think encapsulates many of the dilemmas in which Mexican politics is currently caught. The graph shows uh, total tax revenue as a share of GDP in the horizontal axis and the liberal democracy index from the varieties of democracy project in the vertical axis. The solid lines mark the world average in each dimension. And what I would like to suggest is that over the past decades, Mexico's political development has been quite asymmetric. During the 80s and 90s, Slowly but steady institution building in the democratic sphere dismantled the pre's very long authoritarian regime. So here you can see you know, successive electoral reforms. We now constructed a pretty solid <clears throat> democratic, uh, democratic regime. Mexico joined the club of democratic countries and, an inter and beca even became an international model in very important aspects like the organization of elections with the then federal electoral institute. Democracy also withstood several challenges in its early years, most importantly, the, the very polarized post-election conflict in 2006. So as you can see, starting in, two th in, in, in 2000 with alternation in power, Mexico uh, is above the, the world average in the liberal democracy index. Now, at the same time, governance problems have intensified over the past years. Unlike other countries in Latin America, Mexico's economy has been mostly stagnant over the past several years. Regional inequalities have deepened. Poverty is persistent, affecting 53% of the population in 1992 and 49% in 2018. This was before the pandemic. The bureaucracy is poorly professionalized, making corruption rampant. Criminal violence has exploded. Impunity is widespread. Large parts of the territory are deeply affected by criminal presence. Public education is of low quality. And despite advances in health provision for the informal poor, health institutions remain massively underfunded and thinly spread throughout the territory. At the core of these chronic problems lie a fiscally weak state with a federal government that barely collects 14% of GDP in taxes below even some of the weakest states in the Andean region of Latin America and similar to countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if we conceive of political development as the consolidation of a democratic constitutional state, Mexico clearly advanced in the last decades in the democratic constitutional dimension, but little in the other, the construction of the state. This is visible in the graph with Mexico moving vertically in the democratic dimension but barely in the horizontal dimension, which shows uh, tax revenue as one core indicator of state strength. Now, um, I think what we're, what we're seeing now in many respects um, is that there are two great currents of change that are transforming the Mexican political system that emerged from the democratic transition at the end of the 20th century. This system had been essentially defined by the balance, uh, by balanced electoral competition be between three large party blocs and in parallel by the activation of constitutional 
of uh, separation of powers, legal controls over the executive and the creation of autonomous agencies. Now, I believe there are elements to worry not only about the quality of Mexican democracy, uh, as there have been for many years, but they might be reasons to worry about uh, Mexico's liberal democratic regime, especially about the liberal component of democracy. I am not saying that the collapse of Mexican democracy is imminent, but I, I do think there are political dynamics in motion that no matter what own partisan inclinations are, can be said to be creating risks for further democratic erosion, for the kind of deformation of liberal democracy we have witnessed and are witnessing elsewhere, the type of insidious change from within that may progressively eat into democratic norms and rights until countries are left with sort of the outer covering that resembles democracy, but harbors authoritarianism in the inside. And though often left out of the analysis, Mexico is not immune to international winds that currently do not blow necessarily in favor of democracy. We're seeing a process of deinstitutionalization of the party system that, has, that is moving towards a more unstructured uh, party system. And we know that from comparative experience that the erosion of party systems may also mean the deinstitutionalization of democratic institutions, particularly, as I was saying, of the liberal component of democracy. But to do so, um, you, know, uh, you know, populism may, may produce competitive, competitive authoritarian regimes, but especially when they are successful in government. And I fear that uh, the current AMLO govern government is not necessarily or, or not particularly successful in these governance, these basic governance tasks. He's delivering on his, AMLO is delivering on his anti-establishment mandate, um, is in fact attacking existing institutions, he is in fact delivering on his austerity promises. He has not raised taxes, but he's not necessarily improving the condition of the poor. He's not necessarily governing well. And as a result, Morena may, fa may fail to institutionalize as a movement and materializing its hegemonic um, ambitions. So far, um, more than, um, and, and I think we need to consider then more than the policies uh, that are not necessarily leftist or coherent, it's the appeal to those who resent traditional elites and their own lack of power that helps explain AMLO's popularity. The question of course is how long will it last? There are some, uh, we have, we, I think we can credit the AMLO government. There are some of the good aspects uh, we can say of populism, generating a sense of dignity among of people who have felt excluded and mistreated for long who feel represented and who feel for the first time in a long time that there is a person in power that cares about their, what they think, that respects them and that has empathy for people like them, for the so-called common people. And that is of course important in the sense of uh, basic democratic representation. But it is operating at a symbolic level without real advances in social inclusion. AMLO is also intolerant with populism, with pluralism. Um, he does not recognize the fundamental legitimacy of opposing views and of his opponents. He's uncomfortable with checks and balances. His attempts to centralize power have undermined, undermined the functioning of the bureaucracy. He is uncomfortable with autonomous agencies. He has staffed uh, the state with loyalists all throughout the administration. Uh, he has already captured important institutions. And this is all flowing at the time when part, uh, opposition parties um, have real troubles in commanding, lo uh, in commanding loyalties. And as Ken was saying, uh, partisan loyalties in Mexico are, are not strong and they're anti-establishment mandates that can, may even end up affecting the current government. So um, I think we, we need to consider the charismatic component of his authority to understand um, AMLO's popularity. There is little programmatic consistency. He has veered toward the right in security issues, embraced militarism. militarism. Uh, there is another warring trend for Mexican democracy, the rising presence of the military, now no longer in, in public security alone, but in other dimensions and in all other state institutions. Economically, he has maintained a hawkish appro approach, even dogmatic, uh, even in the face of the pandemic. Um, with budget cuts throughout the state apparatus, no tax reform. In many ways, it is a neoliberal dream. His position in economic policy has been decidedly on the right. So programmatically, it is difficult to situate him on the left in many respects. He's not carrying out uh, on a programmatic mandate. Uh, he's carrying out on a, uh, an anti-establishment mandate. 
And if anything, if you wanted to find something that gives his, his program coherence, I think it, it would be um, his social conservatism, the, the appeals to the Christian right uh, um, and the notion of corruption and restoring uh, the integrity of public administration. And so austerity, his, his hawkish committed, commitment to austerity is part of this idea that, um, that the state has to operate with minimal resources so as to minimize corruption. And AMLO understands that to maintain his popularity, he needs to deliver uh, on his promises to keep his word. That is very important. And so he doesn't want to find himself as, find himself as contradicting himself. And, and I think that is one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, this unwavering commitment to, to certain positions that no matter the pandemic, no matter changing circumstances, he remains uh, wedded to, to his campaign promises. Um, so I, I think I've exhausted my 10 minutes. I have a few more things to say, but I, uh, we can probably discuss them in the, in the Q&A. And thanks again for, uh, for inviting me. Thanks, Mariano, that was great. Um, that brings us to Andres Shepard. Andres, you're up. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Fran, for, for the invitation. A pleasure and honor to be with you uh, this day. Um, I want to focus on, on the topic uh, Viridiana and, and Mariano also already raised on whether AMLO is a threat to democracy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll be trying not to repeat things, uh, uh, which is difficult in, in, in this debate. Uh, Stephen, when he wrote us some introductory notes uh, about that topic, mentioned that, well, opinions about AMLO and democracy are all over the place. And of course, that's true. Yeah? Um, we just need, I think, to, to take a step back and look at the kind of, of the history of that, of, of that debate. Yeah? And the history basically starts, I would say, at the latest in 2006. Yeah? Since 2006, since basically the, the eruption of AMLO in national politics, um, he has been a polarizing figure and polar, polarization kind of attracted by him and irradiating by him, provoked by him, has been all, always two-dimensional. Huh? There was the policy dimension, huh? kind of his discourse about uh, kind of the, the, the neoliberal um, catastrophes produced by his predecessors and by back then current regimes. And on the other side, the discourse of AMLO, kind of the, the harbinger of Venezuelan economic collapse in case that he would uh, uh, occupy positions of power. Uh, so this is kind of the, the, the substantive, the policy dimension. And there has been always the other dimension, the regime dimension. There's always been a regime cleavage around AMLO. Uh, AMLO, um, in, 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 in that um, kind of revival of uh, the leftist threat to democracy that has been kind of the enduring legacy of Hugo Chavez in, in, in Latin America, since 2006, he has been portrayed as kind of our future Chavez. Uh, he will bring socialism to Mexico. He will be, bring ruin to the economy and ruin to the democracy. Uh, so that has been kind of a consistent discourse of his adversaries uh, since 15 years, basically. And on the other side, AMLO has consistently portrayed his adversaries as non-democratic. Uh, he, he would never recognize that before his ascent to power, there has been anything recognizable to democratic. Uh, in his conception of history, there has been kind of the revolution, neo neoliberalism, and then him, the fourth transformation. Uh, uh, so a, a democratic interlude, a democratic transition doesn't exist in his narrative. Uh, so his adversaries always had been those who commit fraud, uh, those who, who, who would not recognize the voice of the people, etc. Yeah? Uh, so today he would, he would portray them as people who want to go back to authoritarianism, who are plotting coups, uh, who are not, um, who are kind of elitists who don't accept the equality uh, and the, the entry of the poor into the public sphere. And on the other hand, 
uh, we are continuing uh, it, more in social networks than in the in the in the public media uh, in the in the mass media perhaps. But there is this continuing rhetoric about AMLO being an authoritarian, a a with with all kinds of of imagery, huh? and and one I think one central element of that debate is it, I would say, openly and transparently hysterical nature. Yeah? So it's it's both sides exaggerate and seem to indulge in exaggeration. Yeah? Uh, and this makes it kind of easy for each side to dismiss the other as, well, this is just hyperbole, this is just rhetoric, this is nothing to be taken seriously. Yeah? So we have we have this, well, this polar assessment, uh, this polar uh, hysteria, which reflect on each other, uh, but no really, no real genuine debate, no, no, uh, I would say realistic, or, or very, very few realistic assessments. Uh, uh, so kind of the way each side accuses each other uh, and, kind of allows them to go on without really listening to each other. Yeah? Um, and in this in this context, I agree with Viridiana. It's it's clear that AMLO does not fit the cliche of um, the aspiring dictator or the actual dictator or the authoritarian uh, chief of government. There's a long list of things he has not done yeah? and kind of other figures like Erdogan, like Putin, like uh, Chavez did in their early years or did at some at some point. Uh, uh, so he, as, as, as Viridiana, as, as, as Mariano have said, he has been doing many things which kind of set off our alarms, uh, like not recognizing the legitimacy of his adversaries, not being able to listen to criticism, uh, criticizing institutions we recognize as, as democratic all the time. Uh, uh, at the same time, he has, he has not been jailing his opponent, not been enacting restrictive laws. He has been uh, refusing to, to, to repre repress opposition protests, etc. Uh, so it's on, on, on the surface, if we, if we look at kind of worst case scenarios, it's clear that uh, that AMLO has not fulfilled kind of the worst dreams of the, of the worst fears of, of, his, of his adversaries. Uh, um, yet I, I would clearly agree with Mariano, it, it, it would be very complacent to say, okay, so it's just a kind of normal majoritarian populist government, we, can, we just, can, just can relax and see how things evolved since uh, they had not been terrible up to now. Um, I would say the least that we can say is that Mexico's democracy continues to be a low quality democracy. Uh, that all those attitudes, uh, all those stubborn attitudes of AMLO towards his critics, his adversaries, uh, his black and white rhetoric, uh, always with a smile, but always with uh, clear disdain towards the conservatives. Uh, uh, these kind of his his refusal to listen to others and to take them seriously uh, clearly has created a, a a democracy which is which ranks very low in terms of deliberative quality. Uh, so in terms of uh, the quality of deliberation around policy making around pu public debate. Uh, is, is, is really deplorable in many senses. And of course, this is never just the fault of one person, of one figure or one party. It's a collective failure, I think. It's, it's also, as everything else in Mexico, it's also the failure of opposition figures, opposition parties, the media. Okay? But still, I think that's, that's quite clear that uh, Mexico is very, very far from our um, uh, ideals of, of democratic deliberation uh, day by day. Then in terms of, of, of violence, it has been mentioned before. Uh, yes, uh, AMLO has been stabilizing levels of organized criminal violence and homicidal violence 
uh, over the past years, but it has been at a very, very high level. Uh, and it seems clear to me that um, the threat organized violence poses not just to Mexican society, not just to ordinary life, not just to the tranquility of citizens, but also to democracy has been persisting. Uh, we have seen dozens and dozens of candidates and political figures assassinated in the previous 2018 elections. We are seeing the same trend right now uh, with candidates, pre-candidates being murdered, uh, other political figures, mostly at the, at the, at the local level, being murdered. Uh, so we, we really have a very, very, a deeply worrisome situation in terms of uh, how does violence um, shape the forms of, 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 of governance, especially uh, of local governance, often really captured by crime. How does it shape uh, local democratic processes often conducted a, a heavy shadow of intimidation, of violence that keeps out many, many candidates. Huh? So these, these, these damages are real and they continue to be real and the government really has no cue what to do about them. Huh? That seems quite, quite apparent. Um, then there is the problem of the military. Mariano mentioned this. Huh? Um, AMLO has been, if you take a step, a, a, a step back to illustrate, to illustrate the point, if you think about uh, the case of the 43 students disappeared in Ayotzinapa, uh, um, this, everybody knows about the case, it was to be the criminal case of the Peña Nieto administration. Uh, the one case he really couldn't watch up, the one case he really needed to conduct well. Uh, and what, what did he do? What did, did his government do? Well, they just did what they do every time. Uh, uh, they just cooked up everything. They invented stories, uh, tortured people, um, invented testimonies, etc. And the only coherent explanation why they why they did that, why they conducted that enormous failure of judicial miscarriage, is because they acted under the shadow of the military. Uh, they just couldn't confront, they didn't dare to confront the military who were closely involved in the whole criminal process. Uh, and AMLO, instead of confronting uh, the military as one of the pillars of de facto power in Mexican democracy uh, before AMLO, he just strengthened them. Uh, he has given them more and more power, uh, even civilian powers, economic powers. So uh, it kind of sounds polemical, but it, 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 it really looks quite realistic. We are on the road to, I don't know, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, with the military really kind of involved into the everyday operation of, of public infrastructure, uh, of civilian tasks, uh, and not to speak of their task in, in, in civilian policing. Uh, so this is what, what, what Mariano called militarism is really a, a, a huge, a huge liberalism trend. Uh, uh, and then just to, to conclude, um, the question whether we are just facing kind of a, a normal majoritarian government or something more worrisome. And here I'm siding with Mariano. Um, you, all, you will all remember that back then in the, what was it, the 80s with Juan Linz. Uh, Juan Linz was very much preoccupied, very much worried about kind of the dangers of divided government in Latin America and in presidential regimes. Uh, he said, well, if you have a president and uh, uh, who confronts a minoritarian legislature that will lead to to confrontations um, and and with the military stepping in and with democracy breaking down huh? over the past years we have learned about the the dangers of unified government uh, the dangers of majoritarian populist government who have been using their uh, their power to capture the state to capture democratic institutions 
uh, to construct uh, non-democratic hegemonic regimes. Uh, and uh, I think AMLO has been kind of traveling that path in a smiling, moderate, um, kind of below the surface way, huh? but it, he has, has been taking steps towards either dismantling or capturing certain state in, institutions. Huh? And I think uh, even if he has not done anything dramatic uh, that would signal a breakdown of democracy, I think that the potential of Morena taking a more authoritarian turn if it conserves its, its majority, and in particular, if it sees its majority in danger uh, in the next, the kind of the next time uh, in, in, in the presidential elections, um, I think we, we, we are well advised not to lower our guard. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, and thanks to all of you. Um, you know, when, when we started doing these um, webinars due to the pandemic, I was always terrified by the, the moderating role is harder here because we have to read through all the questions and filter out the questions and organize the questions and ask the questions, uh, which is not what we do in person. I always, I was always sort of terrified that that would be very difficult for me because I have a, a small brain. And it's never been a problem before because there weren't that many questions and a lot of the questions were crazy. They're about the CIA involvement in Southern Africa in the 1950s and space lasers, and you could sort of sort them out. But this time you guys have finally done it. We have dozens of really good questions. I'm not gonna be able to get to even remotely most of them. Let me try to throw uh, about a half a dozen at you guys. Uh, you guys can pick and choose and answer the ones that you want. And I'm gonna ask you to take, uh, if you can, three or four minutes per person in, in, in responding. So here we go. Let me try to summarize as many questions as I can. These again, um, to the audience, these were terrific questions. So first question, this comes in part from Brian Palmer Rubin. Uh, why is AMLO so averse to Keynesianism? What explains this seemingly, uh, seemingly irrational commitment to, to fiscal austerity or orthodoxy? Um, Another question, and I'm sorry that I didn't organize these in any coherent way. Uh, one uh, attendee asked whether AMLO might face uh, lawfare-like charges after, whether he might perceive that he would face lawfare-like criminal charges after leaving, leaving office. And let me combine that with another question, which is what, is there any chance, is there any movement to potentially change the constitution and, and run for reelection? A uh, question for Vidi, which is what, what steps might AMLO take to tackle this question of inequality, the inequality gap in Mexico? Um, there were a couple of questions about the military. This Andreas picked this up with this very provocative uh, Pakistanization of Mexican politics. But I'd love to hear some of the others talk about uh, how consequential AMLO's embrace and mobilization of the military uh, is. I mean, uh, if it's Pakistanization, then it's obviously pretty consequential. But how much of a threat does, does, the, does the growing military role in, in Mexican society pick, uh, pose potentially for democracy? There were questions about AMLO's support base. Ken already tackled this a bit, but would love to hear what others have to say. A couple of questions comparing AMLO's support base to that of, of Trump. Um, so I guess the question is, what would it take for AMLO's public support to seriously erode for, for, for the sort of hardcore Morena supporters to, to, to lose faith. I mean, uh, could, could AMLO shoot somebody on Avenida Reforma and, and still hold on to, to, to his support base? Um, question about the opposition. Obviously the, the um, opposition parties are, are pretty weak, pretty discredited, highly fragmented. Where do you see the leadership, uh, if, if at all, of the opposition emerging in the next, uh, you know, one to four years. A um, couple of questions on U.S.-Mexican relations. It, it appears to some that uh, AMLO's relations, in somewhat surprisingly, were friendlier with Trump than they than they may be with with Biden, particularly on on uh, oil and gas issues. And somebody asked what what impact the recent events on the border might have for U.S.-Mexican relations. 
June asks how significant these uh, social movements uh, against femicide are, whether they're likely to, to impact the, the to, to sort of generate a response from the government, particularly given AMLO's flirtation or alliance with, with Christian conservatives. Um, let me stop there and give you guys a chance to, to answer. And if we have a chance, we'll do one more round. Why don't we go in the, uh, in the same order as the presentation, so we'll start with Ken. Thanks, those are uh, fantastic questions. I, I'm just gonna make a few very brief comments because I really wanna hear from, from my colleagues um, who I think are gonna have uh, much better things to say. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, behind the scenes, AMLO really liked uh, most of Trump's influence because it gave him cover. I mean, it's, it's not to Mexico's benefit to have a large number of Central American migrants coming through Mexico. It poses all kinds of, uh, of risks and difficulties, and it gives him cover to send the National Guard to the southern border. Um, and, uh, and I think that he got along well with Trump's rhetoric about sovereignty. Uh, you know, the, the, the Mexico has clearly had a lot of sovereignty difficulties with the United States, and uh, it was useful to be able to throw that back at Trump uh, when uh, uh, questions about Mexico's sovereignty, especially with respect to um, intelligence sharing, arose. Uh, that's a major area of, of friction right now. Uh, the Cienfuegos indictment, uh, General Cienfuegos indictment uh, in the US and then uh, sending him back to Mexico where he was essentially uh, let off or not tried for for the, uh, the crimes he was accused of. Um, I think that uh, um, relations with, with Biden as the person who wrote the question pointed out um, are, are very strained over the issue of oil and gas because of course uh, Biden is talking about a green agenda and AMLO has um, uh, the, these ambitions of creating a new refinery and really uh, expanding uh, extraction of oil that has been reducing quite significantly on a year over year basis from the main oil fields um, and would require significantly more investment to get things out of the deep waters in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, last thing I'll say is that uh, um, I think others will have better things to say about this, but uh, the opposition um, was really pathetic in the past presidential elections in 2018. The candidates were were, were really sort of um, uh, uh, pathetic figures in a lot of ways. I see the, um, the possibility of a new figure emerging, especially somebody who's, uh, who's really quite young, uh, um, uh, I think could gain a lot of support from, um, from a new generation of politically active young people in, Mexico's, in Mexico. AMLO's support tends to be older. As I mentioned before, it tends to come more from men than it does from, from women. And uh, it is somewhat heterogeneous, but uh, I think that uh, it could be taken over by another candidate. Maybe one way of thinking about the, the change in the party system that we're witnessing is to use David Samuel's idea of presidentialized parties. For a long time, Mexico's parties looked a little bit like a hybrid between sort of parliamentary style parties and presidential style parties. Now they seem to be thoroughly presidentialized and you need a major candidate to lead the ticket. And I think one could wrest significant support from Morena moving forward. But, uh, but you know, who knows? That's just my guess. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Very good. Next. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I want to focus on the question of uh, spending and why AMLO is not increasing debt or uh, taxation. So I think that uh, there are at least three things here to consider. The first one is what I call his trauma, his trauma of the debt crisis. Uh, for my book, I was that, Steve, I'm going to send you my draft, but for my book, um, I was trying to um, you know, understand like how AMLO came came up, right? And and when you look at the early mission statements of the documents of the PRD, you find that they were mobilizing because of the burden of the foreign debt, and because they thought that 
that theft was affecting the living standards of Mexicans. So in some ways, uh, if AMLO were to increase theft during a crisis, he would be betraying, well, like 30 years of political career, right? So it's an ideological thing for him. I, and I also think, second point, that uh, he doesn't want to accept lender's conditions. He thinks that if he incurs on debt, uh, that's going to weaken his capacity to politically maneuver. Uh, he's seen that actually in, in Pemex, right? Like uh, Pemex right now is it's such an adapted company, the Mexican oil company, that practically operates under the permission of, of international rating agencies. Agencies, right? So there is some limitations that AMLO don't want to uh, take. And then finally, I think that he feels that as a left, perceived as left, because I agree he's not very lefty, as a perceived as left candidate, he needs to keep an image of fiscal responsibility, right? So the metrics that uh, capital is going to use to measure a potential increase in debt uh, in AMLO's government uh, may not be the same that uh, capitals use uh, for judging Peña Nieto uh, when, for example, you know, in the last six, eight years now, uh, um, he increased debt in 10 GDP points, right? Uh, just like, you know, in a blink. Uh, so I, I think that he is also concerned about the potential backlashes that may come from the international community. Now, uh, second thing, and very briefly, I, I, I think th this, is, this is an interesting debate, right? About There is an interesting debate about polarization. I want to touch upon that because I was reading the work of Rodrigo, right? Uh, Barrenechea, right? Rodrigo. Uh, from Harvard. And remember, he has these like category, right, of like two types of populism, catch-all or very polarizing populism. My feeling is that AMLO uh, and Morena particularly is not, a, you know, is not a very polarizing party in, in terms of, of Rodrigo's uh, contribution. And I don't see extreme polarization happening in the horizon because when you look at the people, at the electoral support for Morena, at least for 2021, in the surveys that I have seen, uh, you see that actually the votes are pretty much well redistributed distributed, uh, among age, among income, among education levels, and actually among gender. I, I, I Females vote more, right? But like, once you consider that, the proportion of voters, then you get that it's actually also kind of like very balanced. At least that's the service I have seen recently. This is February 2021. Um, so I don't think that uh, Morena is going to be a very polarizing electorate. If anything, I think that uh, Morena is catching kind of like all the votes that uh, felt orphaned after the collapse of the party that happened with the Pacto por México, right? Because the Pacto por México kind of like diluted the differences between the center, the right and the left in Mexico. Great. Mariano. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you uh, to the audience for this uh, great and challenging question. So I, I do want to, to touch on the issue of, of austerity and, and you know, what explains this, this aversion to Keynesianism, as, as Brian, Brian put it. And it does seem it's irrational in, in some way, uh, but I, th I think it's pretty consistent with, his, with AMLO's worldview, but also with his um, necessity of sort of remaining an, an anti-establishment figure. So austerity is part of the, the narrative about honesty, honest government, uh, austere government, uh, in a way that he has juxtaposed that against the abuses of the past. Um, and it's very important for his popularity, for the popularity of the AMLO government too, so for his credibility as a leader. He values keeping his word because he understands that it depends on being perceived as as you know, something different as he's not doing what the establishment politicians have done. And so he takes these promises and the, and the, the, the more he's criticized on those things, the more he uses that to show that he can resist those pressures. You know, it, more or less it happened the same thing with the use of, of face masks, which is again, something that you, know, you would think is not that important, but he turns them into symbolic battles to signal that he remains independent, that he is not, what he's, that he's doing what he promised and not what the system is pressuring him to do. And of course, there's also the historical component that, that Vidi just mentioned that, you know, his commitment to, to low public spending uh, 
has even intensified with the expanding crisis with the, with the pandemic. Um, and it's rooted in this particular, in Mexico's particular history with bailouts. Uh, you know, in, unlike in other countries where fiscal stimulus may be viewed as a leftist policy, you know, many Mexicans, in fact, and Amlo himself, associated with helping businesses linked to the political right. You know, so in the in the tequila crisis, you know, a government uh, remember the, the bailout, the bank bailouts, and they were full of corruption. Many view that as an episode of privatizing profits and socializing losses. Amlo has made a, his career criticizing that, so he understands that the moment that he is seen as contradicting his promises and sort of um, catering to, to the interests or, or, or ceding to the pressures uh, of the so-called the system or the establishment, his, his own credibility as a leader is going to suffer. And uh, about the popularity, I do want to very quickly share, sh uh, share this graph, which I think you know, is very telling of, of, AMLO, of the sources of, of AMLO support. You know, uh, what we're seeing is in many, in many issue domains, uh, his government is is really in fact suffering. So here is how do you um, uh, how do you rate the the government's performance? And so in the economy is is becoming worse and worse. Same in in public safety. Same with respect to poverty. Uh, same with respect to education. No, no mention health. But then when you ask people, uh, you know, how do you see how do you rate the president in leadership? He's pretty high. Honesty, it's pretty high, even though in capacity to deliver results, there's, you know, he's no longer, uh, he doesn't have a majority in that. So people don't think that the government is doing very well, but he, they think that AMLO is honest, that he's a good leader, that he cares about uh, the country and that, and he's a nationalist. And that's, you know, another important source, I think of his popularity, the, the idea that he, cares about Mexico, he doesn't care about the world, and you know, Mexicans like that, many Mexicans like that. Um, so that, that is, a, I think, another source of, of his remaining popularity. Now, um, with respect to, to the opposition, and so that, that is the, the big question, where are things going from here? You know, the real social opposition, I think, is, is rising in the feminist movement. I think the feminist movement in Mexico has in, gathered incredible strength. Uh, and has really challenged the government, um, you know, outflanked the government on the left. Now, the problem, of course, it's it, it's not an institutionalized political movement. It's a it's a social movement, and so far, uh, the opposition opposition parties have not been able to pick up that uh, to keep up the, those the, to pick up those grievances um, credibly, right? And there, it's not necessarily an issue that say the PAN owns. Um, now, where might we see, you know, emerging leaders or opposition uh, coalition? Well, it's an enigma whether that will happen. If we might move into a more destructured system in which the vote is just fragmented, and so Morena loses some some support, but that support uh, becomes dispersed among several opposition parties. Um, now, something that we haven't mentioned is uh, the possibility of. You know, some leaders coming out from the states, you know, Mexican federalism, uh, there's also a lot of tensions in the federal system. Uh, it, it, ten, 10 state governments that are run by opposition governments are sort of trying to organize some kind of institutionalized opposition to the federal government. There are a couple of governors there, the governor of Jalisco, the governor of Chihuahua, that are, are trying to, you know, bring the opposition together uh, with them. It's unclear whether they will be able to, to do it. Um, uh, but you know, with the worsening pandemic, we I think that you know Mexico has done incredibly poorly in the pandemic, and with respect to health, with respect to the economy, and so um, it's it, it it might take some time, but I think you know inevitably uh, the government I think will will lose support. As for the potential for changing the constitution that was floated at, at some point, um, there were some even some uh, talks of replacing the constitution. I think that's that's not going to happen. They they. And they have managed to to change the constitution in several aspects already, so they don't they don't even need to. Um, so I would leave it there. Thank you, Mariano. Andres. Many thanks. There's many super good questions, um, and I think we are already a bit over time. So I'll, I'll just say one thing. Um, I think one one parallel between 
between AMLO and Trump. And one thing I think he himself might have been appreciating uh, is that here are two guys which really don't quite fit our explanatory schemes in political science. Uh, they, they don't respond very well to incentives. They don't act in a way we would easily recognize as rational. Uh, uh, they do things we, we can't explain easily. Uh, and uh, they're both kind of stubborn outsiders who follow their instincts, uh, their deep convictions, uh, vilified by the press, uh, and do things out of, out of kind of uh, deep inner convictions they are not willing to shed. Uh, and in case of AMLO, I think he has a, a moral theory of power that drives many of his decisions we think are, are destructive uh, of the state or of democracy. Uh, I think basically he has a, a basic distrust of institutions of the state, which is part of his kind of neoliberal outlook. Uh, and he, he trusts people. Uh, and I think that's also one reason why he uh, transfers so much responsibility and so, so, so much power to the military because he thinks those guys are trustworthy. Uh, the military is uh, el pueblo armado, uh, the people in arms. Uh, so he has a very, we would say probably a, a romantic view of the military. Uh, and I think it corresponds to his idea that uh, public integrity is a matter of personal integrity. And so he trusts people who, who um, kind of, he, he trusts characters and he doesn't trust institutions. Uh, and I think this, this explains an awful lot of his kind of strange policy decisions. Thanks, Andreas. I'm gonna to turn to Alicia to uh, lead a lightning round. All right, everyone. Well, the lightning round is going to force us to put AMLO into the rigid analytic schemes that Andreas just tried to reject. So the question to all of you is whether AMLO is a left-wing populist. Should we view him on the left? And maybe moving beyond that, if Morena does try to build a brand beyond AMLO, will it be a sort of center-right, socially conservative, moralistic one? or will it be something on the left that we could recognize as such? So Ken, lightning round answer. Subsequent leaders of Morena will be more on the left than AMLO is. Great, Viri. No, I don't think AMLO is on the left. A left party would increase the spending uh, during the crisis. Uh, I'm not sure the future is gonna be more lefty. I actually, I'm afraid, um, we may see the rise of a populist, but on the on the right in Mexico. Great. Mariano. Um, I would think he's on the left in his genuine concern of the poor, um, the importance he attributes to social policy and his energy nationalism. But he's definitely not on the left by international standards in terms of you know concern for the environment, um, government spending, so on and so forth. And I don't think Morena is going to consolidate as a modern leftist party. Uh, anytime soon. Great, Andreas. I think he's certainly on the left in his concern for equality. His uh, the primacy he gives to uh, to the combat against poverty. Um, he certainly he certainly fits, at least as a campaigner, the the description of a populist. Huh? one who, who constructs the main cleavage between the people against the corrupt elite. Um, whether he will be able to, to, to solidify, to institutionalize something like a left-wing populist party, I don't know, so I agree with Ken. Uh, many of the people who surround him are more clearly situated to the left than he himself. That's great, those answers, not only interesting, but incredibly concise. Uh, so first of all, let me thank our um, four speakers uh, for terrific presentations and great answers. I also want to thank the audience for a really unprecedented set of, of great questions. I apologize that we couldn't get to, to all of them. Uh, and finally, um, I just want to announce that next week we've got another great uh, panel. The, it's on the future of U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America. Under the Biden administration, we've got former Mexican Foreign Minister Jorge Castaneda, 
uh, Arturo Valenzuela, former uh, Assistant Secretary, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Hemispheric Affairs, and also former Costa Rican President Laura Chinchilla. So join us back next week. Uh, again, many, many thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this and, and learned a tremendous amount. Take care, everybody. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.